Hi, my name is Dave Grisanti. Um, oh, uh, we're intro slide in a second. I just didn't want to cut, cut us out. So we're going to talk today about what we learned designing and scaling a multi-tenant developer platform. Uh, like I said, uh, my name is Dave Grisanti. I'm a principal engineer at the New York Times, and I'm going to hand it over to Ahmed to get started. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. And let me start with our uh, mission statement, like we seek the truth and help people understand the world. Uh, like, are we doing like that by aiming to build a essential subscription bundle for every English speaking curious person who seeks to understand and engage with the world? So at the New York Times, we serve like different type of products uh, between news and journalism is the most recognizable product for us, but we also have games like Crossword, Spilling Bees, and other games that you might be familiar with. Also, we have cooking. If you are looking for some amazing recipes, then Thanksgiving is coming along. Uh, wire cutter and audio and the athletic for sport. So I'll start by a couple terms around here to get us on the same page. So when I talk about platform team, we really focusing on the delivery engineering organization. That's our team where like we build a platform around the organization to help uh, other engineering teams. When I talk about team, it's like the product engineering organization where like these are the teams that building all of the product features that uh, I just talked about. So there are a few topics here that I'm gonna go through. Like I'm gonna talk about like why are we building internal developer platform at the New York Times. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about the runtime architecture. And then we'll hand it over to David, talk about uh, application templating, continuous delivery. And then are we going to tell you what did we learn through our journey for this uh, process. So let's start with the developer journey. When we talk about like developers, they have a journey like customer journey. And like they starting by getting their business requirement until they deliver their application. So we talk about all of the phases that they go through from planning, design, create, like monitoring, and all of the steps they go through. But like, there are a few steps are here, kind of like our commonality between most of the applications that we're looking for. And these are the pieces that I highlighted here. And in these steps, you can see like, that's where our platforms can come in and try to like standardize and make sure that we deliver standard experience to all of the engineering teams across the organization. So, but innovation has a cost. When like we give all of the tooling to engineers around, like they build things, really amazing and innovative products, but in different techniques and different tooling and different standards. So if we can imagine something about, we have like different color plates here and, and color ballots, and then I, we ask to mix them together and see what is the result that every team can come, come up with. So you're probably looking at something like that. It's just like, it's the same tools, but like each team creates their own standards and creates their own like way of how they start like building their services and building their code together. So our goal here is not to limit their innovation, but it's more to help like to deliver like a standard experience and make like these tools are adapted in a faster way. So we come up to like how we're gonna make this happen and what are the commonalities between all of the steps that I talked about earlier. So we start talking about like the workflows that the users go through from like the previous slides that I was mentioning earlier. And then that starts by creating an application that will template all of the resources that the team need to get their application started. Then they have the source control for their application where like everything comes through and then we provide them with a CI CD step, which like have all of the building, test and deploy steps. Then we have the runtime, which we'll dive more deeper into. That's where like we come in like Kubernetes clusters and build on, based on cloud resources and other things. And last is ingress. That's where like all of the traffic from the customer side is coming. And we back all of this by observability levels that observes the entire process for our team. So now let's dive deeper into like how we are doing the runtime architecture. So we experimented with different setups for our cloud account setup. And that like between like having a single account and having a multi-account and different things. So we found out that the multi-account architecture is the best fit for us. 
because it gave us like a lot of group workloads with a common business purpose, indistinct account, avoid dependencies and conflicts. It also like applied distinct security control between like development, production, and all of other things. And it have like a cost of like, a, while like we have separation, we can give teams like more freedom about innovation. So they really can like have their dev accounts and they start innovate and build new products. But we also limit the scope. Oh. Okay. That also limits the scope of impacts between accounts because they have like different accounts that they can be able to go through. So now we have like the management account that like every team gets their account, but like how we centralize the runtime architecture here on like how things are being done in the organization. So usually like if you try to build an uh, internal platform or runtime centralized uh, runtime architecture, you come as with a dilemma. And this dilemma is about like, do we run like a multi single tenant clusters, which like we operate all the clusters. So team A and team B, each one get like a specific Kubernetes cluster on their side and we just manage it for them. Or we go for like a single cluster across the entire organizations and we start like doing the multi tenants. And while this can fit in some use cases and the other can fit in other use cases, I think like we started to look into like why we would do each and like how we settle on the things that we need. Uh, and it's not one solution fits all, like it's depend on the organization and depend on how the team wanna open, like be open to maintain and orchestrate all of the work happening. So to go through why we decided what we decided, we have to go through on the requirements and what do we have actually to decide on. So let's start by network isolation. So if we decide either, we will wanna have like a network isolation on the clusters if we have multi-tenancy, for example. Because by default, like the single tenant cluster is already isolated from the other. So like you get one cluster, you don't have access to the others. But when you talk about multi-tenancy, we have to ensure that like each namespace or each tenant is isolated from the other tenants. So they can't like escape and for example, like if someone being able to attack one tenant, they can escape to the other tenants, for example. Role-based access control, how we make sure that all tenants get the right uh, scope for their access and spaces, or namespaces. And operational agility, how like we make sure that this entire process is automated and like we can do faster like how we can onboard tenants to our clusters. Also, one of the aspects that we look into is the policy driven security. So like when we talk, for example, like the entire platform is built on top of EKS, for example. So how we can make sure that like, if we are running in a multi-tenant cluster, I'm not be able to assume a different role from another tenant that already have set up their account or a different service. Also resource management, how we ensure like you are using the right resources for your application and you are not like a noisy neighbor for others and all of that aspects here. So combining the multi-account architecture with like the multi-tenant architecture, I think we found like a good use case for how we will design our runtime architecture here. And like we came to a conclusion that multi-tenant clusters are best fit for our needs. So we recognize that this approach help us achieve our goals and minimize the operational uh, overheads that we have. And to support the approach, we created a runtime environment that could be distributed across multiple regions to also ensure failovers. As you can see here that we have like multi-region clusters across different environment and each team account by default when they are onboarded to the platform, they get access to these clusters by default. And as I mentioned earlier, it's important to understand that no one size fits all. So that solution and design considerations fits our use cases and the things that we need. So now we talked about the multi-tenant clusters and multi-account, but like there's one aspect of like how we make the onboarding process easier because like now we have like hundreds of teams that we need to keep onboarding automatically. So for that perspective, we start to think about like, uh, can we do it in GitOps mode? Can we, can we have this as a self-service? How we can make sure that these teams are onboarded to the clusters without too much of like uh, manual intervention. So we came up to a conclusion where like, can we automate that? Yes, we can. But like, where is the glue to automate like the tenant onboarding with the actual accounts? So we built something around 
operate operators. If you're familiar with the Kubernetes operators, so operator is like just make sure that we recycle something and operate and acknowledge it. So it keeps this iteration in a way that like every tenant is aborted they will get something in return for that. So what happens here is like, once your cloud account is being created, we listen to these events, and then we still follow a GetOps approach, where like, we transform that event to a CRD, as you can see here. So a CRD is a reference for a tenant, and that say, this tenant belonged to that account. So when that happens, the operators behind the scene built different things that allow us to achieve our design consideration. Starting with the tenant onboarding and the network isolation here, we're using Cilium. So Cilium provide us with capabilities that we can like isolate the namespaces created for that tenant automatically. So once we onboard the tenant, we get like all of that, all of the network isolation here. There are like our Cilium policies specific to a tenant and there are like cluster wide policies specific for tenants. The other things that we're looking around, and I mentioned that earlier, is like we're using EKS. So if you're familiar with ERSA, I am role for service account, like that's how services are actually consuming AWS resources. So one of the areas that we found that anyone in a multi-tenant can use the same because they are using the same OIDC, they are using the same trust policy. So in this scenario, how we want to make sure that like a specific IAM role for a different tenant doesn't like just fail and you can assume it as another tenant. So that's another part of the operator itself. So the operator will like set a constraint per tenant, per namespace specifically, and that will ensure that you only can assume the roles that it's related to your account. And that's based on the specification of your tenant CRD. And the last thing that I wanna go through is, I'm not gonna go through the entire ingress model, but there is another piece that how your traffic comes to the cluster. So to describe this like really fast, uh, our ingress model is based on like Envoy. So like this is how all of the traffic comes through and then like we forward this to upstream. And you can see like we have a service mesh setup based on STO and like that's on a multi-region and we have all of the service can communicate to each other. But like how we set this with the tenant onboarding. So what we do here is the multi-tenant setup same thing, like the same operators, the same CRD. So for all of this, we have a single CRD for a tenant that now start to template once it's onboarded to the cluster, that will template all of the resources needed for Istio itself from a gateway, from a certificate, from all of the things that we need at this point to make the tenant viable and they can start just like deploying more applications. And at this point, like all of our runtime is set up and tenants can start like just consume Kubernetes resources as in general and start like moving to the next steps where like how they start to template their application and they have their build and pipeline. And here I'm gonna pass it to David. He's gonna walk us through that. Hey everyone. Uh, so yeah, next we are going to talk about two sections, kind of stepping back a stage, uh, back to more what the developers are interacting with. So as I've been talked about, we you know, kind of designed some of the runtime concepts first, multi-tenancy, the multi-account. And then we had this challenge of figuring out you know, how we make this easy for, uh, for developers at the times to use, how do they kind of onboard. So we had this goal of allowing developers to build fully functional services running in production on day zero in under 10 minutes, which is an ambitious goal. I think we're mostly the way there. There's, some, there's a couple of things that take maybe longer than that that are still need manual approval, but um, you know, the, the idea is, is still present and we're working towards that, that time period. But generally we kind of built uh, this template engine that includes a bunch of capabilities for developers and then they only have to kind of plug in um, their own logic, which is that user provided thing on the right. So I'll go through some of these in more detail uh, in a second, but you know, the idea is to give them all of the necessary things that they need to use the runtime architecture, the ingress layer, and their multi-tenant like AWS account without them having to do much more than provide a few details. And then all they're doing is working on app logic. Uh, so the, generally all of this is stored in, in, in GitHub someplace. Like it's maintained in the GitHub repo. We're following GitOps principles um, for, for all the pieces. There's a couple external systems, which I'll, we'll show in a second, but generally uh, everything's stored as source code in, of some type. Um, so the, the first two items, source code control setup, 
and the code starter kit, you can kind of pick a few different languages uh, to start from, but we'll give you either a Go app, Go app or you can choose a, a Docker template, which you can provide your own code, your own Docker file, and then we'll build it for you. Uh, the observability tooling is based on open telemetry. Uh, for the Go starter project, that'll include you know, metrics and traces out of the box for you, ship it off to the observability tooling, and um, open telemetry libraries are you know, a little bit easier for some of the other languages, but uh, we're working towards providing support for it, like the four or five that are our, our core things. Uh, the next is secrets integration into Vault, um, and I don't know about how people feel about, about Vault, but it tends to be sort of complicated to get secrets in and then get them injected into Kubernetes in, in like the, the perfect way. So the, our, our goal is that developers should just have to say what their secret is, uh, you know, key value, and then we'll kind of take care of it, putting it in the right spot and setting up the Kubernetes template so that it'll, you know, pull it in for them. Containerization is the next thing. So like I mentioned, the uh, starter project comes with the Docker file. You don't have to do anything. If you want to use your own code, uh, that's not Go or one of the languages we support. Um, all you have to do is just change the Docker file. We'll build it, push it to the uh, registry for you, and get it deployed. Uh, the next two things are kind of a, a combo, uh, build and test pipeline uh, and the deployment pipelines. And we're using a combination of some CI tooling and Argo CD, if folks are familiar with that, uh, to do deployments to Kubernetes. Uh, so Drone is responsible for most of the build and, and testing jobs and Argo is responsible for doing all of the infra deployments uh, to Kubernetes. And one of the other things that the application templating does is set up all the necessary Argo stuff for you, the app project and uh, application sets that are needed to manage the multi-tenant permissions uh, to kind of match with what I was talking about before to make sure that you know, your people aren't crossing namespaces or uh, crossing, between, crossing between tenants. And then the last thing, which might be the most complicated, at least for uh, users who aren't really comfortable doing Kubernetes, is like all of the YAML that they need to get their app running so that they're not kind of writing that themselves. Uh, so we're kind of using a, a few different tools. Most of what we're doing now is built on Customize. Uh, we're playing with you know, where Helm can come in to abstract some of that away from a user so we're not dumping a bunch of customized stuff into their repositories that they have to manage later. Uh, but in general, if you just want to get a Go app or a Go API up and running on the platform, and you don't care about any uh, complex stuff within Kubernetes, you shouldn't have to touch really anything that we give you, other than you know giving the name of an app and <clears throat> your target um, tenant. You should be up, up and running in, in a few minutes. So, what does that look like from like a workflow perspective? So, uh, as a team or a user, your first step is you fill out this form, uh, generally giving us some information about what GitHub team you're from, um, what tenant you're targeting what the name of your app is, what language you're using, um, do you want to use some experimental features that we're working on, you click Submit, and then <clears throat> that all your responses get stored as a JSON file inside of a GitHub repo, and that kicks off a drone job, and that basically spits out a, a few different GitHub repos that represent what goes in Vault, um, the actual secrets in Vault, and then what gets templated out as these Argo projects uh, that handled you know, syncing all of your deployments to Kubernetes, and then you know, assuming that all your the PRs get merged and everything happens, then your, your app is up and running in, in uh, our runtime cluster. Uh, so what the user sees is kind of just, just this simple form, and then we tell them, like, here's all your stuff stored in GitHub if you want to understand that. Uh, but the idea is that the, all they're really interacting with is that, is that form interface. So let's talk a little bit about the continuous delivery from a multi-tenancy perspective. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about Argo specifically. Um, I won't go into a ton of detail, but since that's kind of where the, most of the multi-tenancy stuff came in, I want to focus on that. So our, our idea was we wanted to you know, follow GitOps principles um, for delivery to Kubernetes with the centralized CD software platform, um, would kind of pave the way for more advanced capabilities down the line. What we found with teams using Drone, and I think a lot of this happens a lot of common just YAML interfaces from CI tools, is that when people wanted to do more complex things like Canary or Blue Green or some, something more than just deploy this YAML, they would write it themselves, and there was just enough variation across all the teams that maintaining it got very complicated, um, and it was hard to kind of standardize a, a common way of doing any of those one things. Argo kind of made that a lot easier because it abstracts a lot of the complexity away. Um, so our goal with providing this tool was to you know, pull away from people having to write a lot of the YAML themselves. Um, and we wanted to offer some predefined workloads, templates, and best practices, 
and adopt common workflows to align with what they were kind of already doing with the dev lifecycle. So for the Argo setup, we went with one Argo to rule them all. Uh, there's a couple different ways you can kind of run Argo similar to a bunch of different ways you can manage Kubernetes clusters. You can install Argo like along with each cluster if you are running one cluster per team, or even one Argo for dev, one Argo for stage, prod, depending on how many environments you have. We're kind of doing this you know, single control plane version where we have a single Argo that, that deploys to all of our environments, which simplifies things for users because when they log in, they can see um, their, you know, their apps running in dev and stage and prod. And we also have, we're also using the Argo pull request generator so people can get previews of pull requests as soon as they open them. Um, you know, one Argo is kind of handling all that, so it gives them a much simpler interface. Um, there was some kind of security controls that we had to balance uh, as we move forward with Argo. So when we initially installed it, our, our security team came back and said, you know, <laughs> based on the way that the default Argo installation was done, I was able to get in and do all these things with the roles that Argo set up that I shouldn't be able to do. Uh, so they came back and said, here's some rules that you have to follow. So we don't want Argo to have cluster-wide admin access, which it wants by default. We want the permissions limited um, to namespace level in the target clusters, like in the clusters customers are going to. And you have no access to install custom CRDs. Us being the team that's running Argo versus the team running the runtime environment. Like, don't assume that just because you're in the same org, you have you know, admin level permissions. You need to be treated kind of like a tenant. So our solution to this was a few things. So we separated the pipelines that did um, the Argo workloads and what kind of handled the, the RBOC and the CRD installation. The, automation that installed the runtime clusters, we kind of gave the CRDs over to them to let them handle the custom CRDs for us, and then that kind of limited Argo's scope of, of control that it needed. Uh, we had to customize the Argo CD Helm chart a bit to separate out those CRDs and cluster roles uh, and only be worried about installing Argo in a target namespace. And then the last thing, which was probably the most complex thing we had to do, was customize the way that the service, accounts, service account that Argo used uh, to remove its kind of like create read, delete star permissions, and do cluster roles and tenant level roles uh, for the Argo, C Argo CD manager um, and the permissions that it had for, for installing. So this diagram maybe explains that a little bit more. Um, so the idea was, you know, within the target cluster, the way that Argo wanted to be installed by default was to have one service account that had access to do everything, install apps for every tenant across the entire cluster, including like the default uh, namespace. So we separated this to be a little custom. We, may, we, we, you know, we still have that service account in there, but that uh, service account has a role that only has read or like get on a few things. You know, no get on secrets, just get on namespace level stuff and a few cluster wide things. Um, and then it inherits uh, tenant level permissions in each of the namespaces the same way that a user would. So it does have access to read and create and delete things in all of the um, customer namespaces, but it doesn't have anything at the, at the cluster level. So it can't like delete the whole cluster or do anything administratively. Um, and this was taking advantage of something that uh, I might have talked about earlier, which is the um, Kubernetes operator that we wrote to you know, provision the tenants and create the users uh, was able to give Argo those necessary permissions as part of the installation process. So, the so I talked about in the previous slide with you know installing the custom CRDs, installed that read-only role, and then the um, the operator kind of took advantage of the stuff uh, after that. So then it kind of wraps up the CD portion. Uh, I think we want to kind of start transitioning over to like just general lessons learned that we did with um, kind of each of these phases. I'll go over the first two and then I'll, I'll hand it back to Ahmed to do the last two. So I think one of the things that we have learned and are still learning is that you know, we're not a platform that we're selling out in the world, right? we're an internal platform. So documentation, not that it's tough, I think it's tough for everyone, not tougher for us, but we don't have like a team of people writing documentation. But most of the users using our platform don't understand Kubernetes, uh, don't understand, uh, I'm not sure how many people really understand Kubernetes, but um, <laughs> it's a challenge to write documentation that's clear, concise, and is consistent across all of our teams, like the way that I write it versus somebody in our runtime team writes, writes it versus in the application templating team. Everybody's kind of, you know, context is different and the way that they write is different. So like, we're just 
still learning how to make this approachable for users um, and trying to get constantly get feedback. Um, the next thing is adoption and partnership. Oops, did I just lock my screen? I did. Uh, we've been you know, working a lot on migration. I think I talked a lot about new, new apps. We're trying to get people to migrate over. And one of the ways that we've done that is, done that is just by partnering with teams to like, teach them about what we've built and help them use our tools. And I think like, partnering with them, embedding people has been, has been really powerful. I don't think you need this. Cool. Okay. Okay. I'll use the case. <clears throat> so Desert 2 Pieces is like, a platform is a product. Like one of the common things that I hear, like is that like just like let's wrap it as a project, and that's how like we deliver it and go over it. But like if you wrap it as a project, it would just like deliver like a few features that you have to listen and you have to iterate on top of it. So the ways that we are keep delivering this is. Like we deliver our first iteration of it, hear from our customers, understand what we need to do, and then iterate on in, in the next level. So a couple of things that we didn't have when we started is like, for example, customized helm charts that people can use. Like we started to drop like customized actual YAML files into Rebers, and that's where things got complex. So we start iterate on top of this. Another element of it, like one that I like to say is like, we build a platform, it's not a tool. So like all of the tools behind the scenes should like be changeable. Like I can just like plug like a different CI model or I can plug different CD model or different secret management software. Like all of these pieces that have to continue and to grow based on the most important thing here is the customer feedback. Like a really good thing to understand is that we are building a product for our engineering teams. Uh, as an engineer, I'm like, I want to build the newest shiny thing, which is like makes me feel good about what I'm building. But like at the end of the day, if I'm building something that it's not helping the product engineering teams deliver their code faster, it means like there's something wrong with the platform. So customer feedback is really a critical piece here. And then we have to listen and understand and like see what they really need. Maybe like we are thinking about very complex solution, but they need something simple at the end of the day to just deliver their application without any problems and in a standard way. And that would wrap it all. So thank you all for uh, being here. And oh, you did I did that again. Oh, you okay. Your finger point's not gonna work, hopefully. Okay. <laughs> I have too many hot corners. Though. Okay, I'm sorry. now I got it. So <laughs> thank you all. Uh, this is the feedback uh, QR for the feedback session. And we have other sessions coming on Thursday for scaling, how we do scaling uh, with our colleagues from the New York Times. And we just did another session on ArgoCon about uh, how we do multi-tenancy in Argo. So thank you all. Thank you.